It's Friday, November 12th. President Trump's longtime ally, Stephen Bannon, indicted today on two counts of criminal contempt of Congress after he defies a subpoena from the House Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. The indictment comes as a second witness, former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, defies his own subpoena from the committee as Trump escalates his legal battles to withhold documents and testimony about the insurrection. They've gone into overtime in Glasgow, Scotland, as negotiators at the UN climate talks there, still trying to find common ground on phasing out coal and when nations need to update their emission-cutting pledges and especially on money to developing nations to adapt to global warming. The jurors who will decide Kyle Rittenhouse's fate to be allowed to consider lesser charges if they opt to acquit him on some of the original counts that prosecutors brought. That after a contentious court hearing today in which both sides could claim partial victory with a verdict near Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers orders 500 National Guard members to be prepared for duty in Kenosha if local law enforcement requests them. A parade of black clergy expected next week to visit the trial of three white men in Georgia accused of slaying black jogger Ahmad Arbery. And the White House says President Joe Biden and China's Xi Jinping will hold their much anticipated virtual summit on Monday evening. The leaders are looking to tamp down tensions after a bad start to the U.S.-China relationship since Biden took office earlier this year. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KBFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Steve Bannon, a longtime ally of former President Donald Trump, was indicted today on two counts of criminal contempt of Congress after he defied a subpoena from the House Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. The Justice Department said Bannon was indicted on one count for refusing to appear for a deposition last month and the other for refusing to provide documents in response to the committee's subpoena. A law enforcement official speaking with anonymity told the Associated Press that Bannon is expected to surrender to authorities on Monday and will appear in court that afternoon. Simon Marks reports. Mr. Bannon and several other figures in Donald Trump's inner circle have ignored subpoenas compelling them to testify in Congress about the January 6th insurrection on Capitol Hill. NBC's Pete Williams on what happens next. This is now going to be handled like any other criminal case. Steve Bannon will be given a date Will will he uh, will appear before a federal magistrate to be arraigned. He will enter a plea. And Mr. Bannon's lawyer has indicated his client will surrender to the authorities on Monday. There are several other prominent members of the former president's inner circle who also now face the possibility of contempt charges for similarly failing to comply with congressional subpoenas. Simon Marks reporting. The indictment came as a second witness. Former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows defied his own subpoena from the committee today as Trump is escalating his legal battles to withhold documents and testimony about the insurrection. The chair of the January 6th panel, Mississippi Congressman Benny Thompson, said he will recommend contempt charges against Meadows next week. If the House votes to hold Meadows in contempt, that recommendation could also be sent to the Justice Department for a possible indictment. Democrat Thompson and the vice chair of the select bipartisan panel, Republican Representative Liz Cheney of Wyoming, said in a statement, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Bannon, and others who go down this path won't prevail in stopping the select committee's effort. Getting answers for the American people about January 6th, making legislative recommendations to help protect our democracy, and helping ensure nothing like that day ever happens again.
The indictments of victory for House Democrats who saw dozens of Trump officials decline testimony and defy subpoenas during his presidency. The charges support the authority of Congress to investigate the executive branch and sign and signal to potential consequences for those who refuse to cooperate. Attorney General Merrick Garland said Bannon's indictment reflects the Justice Department's steadfast commitment to ensuring that the department adheres to the rule of law. Each count carries a minimum of 30 days in jail and as long as a year behind bars. Bannon, who worked at the White House at the beginning of the Trump administration and currently serves as host of the conspiracy-minded War Room podcast, is a private citizen. When Bannon declined to appear for his deposition in October, his attorney said the former Trump advisor had been directed by a lawyer for Trump, citing executive privilege not to answer questions. Newly released audio shows former President Trump defended the January 6th insurrectionists who broke into the Capitol and chanted Hank Mike Pence, his own vice president. ABC correspondent Jonathan Carl interviewed Trump for his new book, Betrayal, the Final Act of the Trump Show. Carl asked Trump whether he was concerned about Pence's safety. He Were you worried about him during that, that siege? Were you worried about no, his safety? No, I thought he was well protected, and I, I had heard that he was in good shape. Mm -hmm. No, because uh, I had heard he was in very good shape. But, but, no, you I heard those chants. That was terrible. I mean, it was, you know, the... He could have. Well, the people were very angry. They're saying, "Hang my." Because pants. it's it's common sense, John. It's common sense that you're supposed to protect. How can you, if you know a vote is fraudulent, right? Yeah. How can you pass on a fraudulent vote to Congress? Trump and Pence didn't speak for days after the vice president refused to halt the certification of Joe Biden's presidential win. Carl conducted the interview with Trump last March. A former tech company CEO from suburban Chicago who lost his job after he threw a chair inside the U.S. Capitol during the January 6th riot has been sentenced to 30 days imprisonment. U.S. District Judge Carl Nichols also ordered Bradley Ruxtales of Inverness, Illinois, to pay $500 in restitution. Ruxtales previously acknowledged he stormed the Capitol, threw a chair in the direction of retreating Capitol police officers, and had to be dragged away by officers after he refused to comply with attempts to get him up off the floor of the Capitol. Ruxtales was forced out as CEO of Cogencia and sold interests in the firm after his participation in the insurrection became known. House Republican leaders have remained silent days after Arizona Republican Paul Gosar tweeted an animated video showing him slashing the neck of New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez with a sword. The only two Republican lawmakers to denounce the video, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, those two already on the outs with the rest of the Republican caucus for agreeing to serve on the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. Cheney said Gozar should be censured for what she calls his continued indefensible activities. She's also blasting House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy for his silence. She called it a real symbol of his lack of strength, a lack of leadership in the Republican conference right now and the extent to which he and other leaders seem to have lost their moral compass. McCarthy's also failed to condemn the death threats received by the 13 House Republicans who voted with most Democrats to pass the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. In one voicemail, a caller labeled Representative Fred Upton a traitor, wished death for the Michigan Republican, his family, and his staff. In 2020, Donald Trump overwhelmingly won the presidential election in the state of North Dakota. But at a special legislative session underway there, Republican lawmakers are pushing for changes they feel would clamp down on election fraud. Mike Moen reports. A year after the 2020 presidential vote, 
Proposals are still surfacing on making procedural changes and handling elections. In North Dakota, new ideas that were floated include bypassing the Secretary of State and examining local results deemed questionable and adding fraud detection elements to ballots. Terry Trainer of the North Dakota Association of Counties says county auditors and state officials already do a good job preventing fraud. I, I think it's very secure and for North Dakota, I certainly don't see where we have those sorts of concerns. The Republican House member leading these efforts acknowledges the uphill battle in getting the bills passed during special session, but he says he wants to reintroduce these ideas in future sessions to be proactive. Such moves coincide with national rhetoric from the far right that last year's election was stolen from former President Donald Trump despite no evidence. Trainer contends that more energy should be spent in educating the public as a way to carve out productive conversations about improving elections. Whether it's grade school through high school, higher ed, or the citizens in general, there does need to be more knowledge of how elections work. Trainer questions whether North Dakota has the resources to implement systems needed to get some of these ideas in place. Others reluctant to rush in new procedures note that Trump won North Dakota. Nationally, the Brennan Center for Justice says that over the past year, 19 states have enacted more than 30 laws that opponents say will make it harder for Americans to vote. Mike Moen, Prairie News Service. Support for this reporting was provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. The jurors who will decide Kyle Rittenhouse's fate will be allowed to consider lesser charges if they opt to acquit him on some of the original counts that prosecutors brought. That's what the judge said today during a contentious hearing in which both sides could claim partial victory. Rittenhouse testified that he acted in self-defense when he fatally shot two protesters and wounded a third during an August 2020 night of unrest in Kenosha, Wisconsin, following the police shooting of Jacob Black, an African-American man. Jurors are expected to begin deliberating on Monday after closing arguments in a case that has left Americans divided over whether Rittenhouse is a patriot who took a stand against lawlessness or a vigilante who brought a gun to a protest to provoke a response. With a verdict near, Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers said today that 500 National Guard members would be prepared for duty in Kenosha if local law enforcement requested them. Rittenhouse is charged with several counts, including homicide and attempted homicide, in the killings of Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber, and the wounding of Gage Grosskreitz. Wisconsin law allows the prosecution and defense to ask that jurors be told they can consider lesser charges as part of the instructions they receive before deliberating on the case. With many legal observers saying prosecutors struggle to poke holes in Rittenhouse's self-defense claims, Judge Bruce Schrader's decisions on what to allow in terms of lesser charges could be significant. The judge said he would issue his final rulings on tomorrow, but he also made some findings from the bench today and indicated how he was inclined to rule on others. He addressed Rittenhouse directly at one point toward the end of the day's proceedings, which took place without the jury present. He told the defendant that by having the lesser charges included, he would be raising his risk of conviction, although avoiding the possibility that the jury will end up compromising on the more serious crime, and he would be decreasing the risk he'd end up with a second trial because the jury is unable to agree. Rittenhouse said he understood. Judge Schrader has been very active with his interventions in the case, with some observers concluding he's exhibited bias against the prosecution. Nyada Ramagan reports. Judge Bruce Schroeder, presiding over the Kyle Rittenhouse trial in Wisconsin, interrupted the lead prosecutor Thursday to prevent him from asking a far-right political commentator if the network he works for is biased. This is not a political trial, and um, I, I don't know how you would isolate um, a per person's particular politics uh, and determine that that person is going to uh, evaluate the evidence one way or another.
Rittenhouse is accused of killing two people and wounding a third during a protest over police brutality in Kenosha. I'm Nadia Ramlagan for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. That right-wing political commentator is Drew Hernandez, who called for bloodshed after Donald Trump lost the 2020 presidential election. He videotaped the protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin, the night Rittenhouse killed two people describing Rittenhouse as someone who was trying to de-escalate things. In his testimony, Hernandez, who now works for the right-wing media group Real America's Voice, painted Rittenhouse's first victim, Joseph Rosenbaum, as the aggressor in their encounter. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno, online, kpfa.org. African-American pastors from all over the state of Georgia and the country say they'll travel to be with the family of slain black jogger Ahmad Arbery next week. Their pledge comes after an attorney for one of the three white men facing murder charges in his death said yesterday he didn't want any more black pastors in the courtroom. Attorney Kevin Goff made the statement after Al Sharpton sat with Arbery's parents. He said the presence of more black pastors might be intimidating. Today, Goff, who's representing Roddy Bryan, partially walked back that statement. If my statements yesterday were overly broad, I will follow up with a more specific motion on Monday, uh, putting that and those concerns in the proper context. And my apologies to anyone who might have inadvertently been offended. Attorney Goff's statement provoked outrage the Reverend Sharpton said the remark showed arrogant insensitivity and were insulting to Arbery's family. Arbery's mother, Wanda Cooper-Jones, told the Washington Post, Goff's objection was disturbing, but she said after sitting in the courtroom day after day, nothing surprises her. Arbery family attorney Ben Crump said in a statement that it is not illegal for black pastors to support the parents of Ahmad Arbery or any other black victims. He said they were going to bring a hundred black pastors to pray with the family next week. Outside the courthouse, Greg McMichael's attorney, he's one of the men charged in the murder, Jason Sheffield disassociated himself from Goff's comments, then quickly pivoted to a defense of his client. So I know there's been a lot of reporting on a statement made by Kevin Goff yesterday in court uh, about wanting no more black pastors. Uh, that statement was totally asinine, ridiculous. And I think Kevin has realized that in the heat of what's happened in court and you know, having concerns that this jury could be influenced by various things, that he said that, and I think he's tried to walk that back this morning. I will tell you that the trial is going very smoothly, very well, and it appears that the evidence in this case is overwhelming about one thing and one thing in particular. This case is not about a lynching. This case is not about racism or racist motives. This is just a neighborhood and some people trying to do the best they could to stop the crime in the neighborhood. In the trial today, a police officer testified he planned to give Arbery a trespass warning for repeatedly entering a home in the area under construction. Glynn County Police Officer Robert Rash said he spoke several times to the house's owner, who sent him videos showing Arbery visiting the site several times between October 25th, 2019 and February 23rd, 2020, the day that Arbery was killed at the end of a five-minute chase by white men in pickup trucks. Officer Reich said he had been looking for Arbery, whose identity was unknown at the time, to tell him to keep away from the unfinished home. He said police had a standard protocol for handling people caught trespassing, a misdemeanor under Georgia law. Arbery was killed before the officer could find him. At the COP26 United Nations International Summit on Climate Change in Glasgow, Scotland, diplomats from nearly 200 countries blew past the midnight deadline for striking a global climate accord with talks set to continue throughout the night.
A new draft text of the conference's final report is expected tomorrow morning, according to summit organizers, after which countries will weigh in publicly on whether they want further changes. Going into overtime has become routine at United Nations climate change conferences, which are supposed to last for two weeks. The previous working draft released this morning called for a doubling of the money to help developing countries cope with climate impacts and called on nations to strengthen their emissions cutting targets by next year. But much of the text in the draft, intended to push negotiators toward a deal that all nations can agree on, remained contentious for many countries. Disputes remain over money, the speed of emissions cuts, and indeed whether an agreement should even mention fossil fuels, the principal cause of climate change, but a term that has never before appeared in a global climate agreement. From Glasgow, reporter Benji Heyer. The final gavel was supposed to have fallen, yet still no deal. What we have is a new draft agreement and potentially another one to come. In it, a watering down of commitments to end the use of coal and other fossil fuels, but stronger language on how much richer countries should be giving to poorer nations to deal with the impacts of climate change. Funding has long been an area of contention, and in the dying hours of the summit, it remains a key sticking point. Unanimous consensus is required for any agreement. The aim of COP26 was to ensure that warming is limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius this century. The UN fears that target won't be met. Whether that makes this gathering a failure is a worry. Of greater concern, arguably, is the damage that could come to this planet unless world leaders translate their words into action. Benji Heyer, Glasgow. California Governor Gavin Newsom announced the state has joined the newly formed Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. At the COP26 Climate Summit in Glasgow, Denmark and Costa Rica spearheaded the alliance of governments and regions. They're committing to phase out fossil fuel production and grant no new permits for fossil fuel exploration. Together, our goal, our resolve is, is to commit to lead, lead the way towards a future without harmful fossil fuels. We've already taken significant steps to curb supply and demand of oil production in state. We banned fracking, or at least committed to banning it by 2024, ending the sale on the demand side, ending the sale of new gas cars, eliminating those sales by 2035, new car sales in the state of California, and moving to phase out, committing to a future without oil, committing to phase out oil production by 2045. But California joins the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance as a second-tier associate member because the state has not yet banned new permits for oil and gas exploration and drilling. Environmental justice groups urge Newsom to immediately end new oil and gas drilling. His administration has approved more than 5,000 new oil and gas wells since he became governor. New research by the Center for Biological Diversity shows that over their lifespan, the approved wells will produce an estimated 144 million metric tons of carbon dioxide pollution, equivalent to the emissions from an extra 31 million gasoline-powered cars on the road for a year. In Washington... Democratic members of the House of Representatives returning from the COP26 climate conference in Scotland met today with the group Climate Power to discuss President Biden's social spending plans and climate goals. The conference was held a week before Democratic representatives planned to vote on President Biden's one and three quarter trillion dollar bill on social infrastructure and climate Warming measures. The bill will include key provisions that House Democrats say are essential to meeting Biden's promise to world leaders to cut U.S. gas house pollution in half by the year 2030. Marina Newman reports. 
President Joe Biden, in a speech to world leaders at the start of the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow last week, reiterated his campaign promise to cut U.S. greenhouse gas pollution in half by 2030. However, Representative Kathy Castor of Florida says that President Biden's $1.75 trillion Build Back Better plan, which includes key climate provisions, must pass to achieve this goal. We've already delivered on the uh, Infrastructure and Jobs Act. That's part one of a very important two-step. But this next step on Build Back Better that we intend to pass in the House next week is absolutely vital. It is uh, our, the hallmark of us being able to deliver on President Biden's pledge to cut pollution by 50 percent by 2030. And it really sets us up for success, uh, getting to net zero as soon as possible and no later than 2050. Despite a major setback to President Biden's agenda of passing the Build Back Better plan in the House next week, following Democratic Senator Joe Manchin's announcement that he will not support the bill in its current form, House Democrats remain optimistic. Representative Joe Neguse of Colorado says that he trusts his colleagues will see the urgency of the moment when the infrastructure bill appears before the House. The time to do something is right now, and the solution is a clear one. It is passing the Build Back Better Act, which we uh, certainly intend to do in the coming days in the House. And we trust that our colleagues in the Senate will recognize the urgency of the moment and do the same. If we are able to get that across the finish line, when we are able to get that across the finish line, we will have secured over a trillion dollars in climate investments, uh, a transformational investment in our country's uh, history, and one that ultimately I believe will meet the moment uh, as we do our part to save our planet. Representative Sean Caston of Illinois says that many world leaders at the COP26 climate conference were skeptical of the United States' ability to follow through on their climate goals. Representative Caston says that passing the Build Back Better Act will indicate to world leaders that the United States can not only be a reliable actor, but a leader in addressing climate change, following former President Donald Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. The way that we say not only is the United States focused on what's scientifically necessary, but we actually deserve to be in a position of leadership because we are going to show not by our words, but by our feet that we are committed to this. The way that we do that is by passing the Build Back Better Act. And we will then be at a point where we can look ourselves in the eye, much as the rest of the world is looking ourselves in the eye after COP and saying that we in the United States have now made the single biggest commitment to tackling climate change in our history. For KPFA News, I'm Marina Newman. Storm damage, pollution, and other factors, some related to climate change, are reducing the oyster population. But settlement funds from the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill disaster are now available to restore oyster reefs in the Gulf of Mexico. Roz Brown has that story. Experts estimate the Gulf lost between 4 and 8 billion oysters to the massive oil spill and also saw a loss of reproduction in ensuing years. Chad Hansen with the Pew Charitable Trust says federal and state officials have earmarked almost $40 million for new or improved reefs to help the shellfish reproduce and thrive. The sad news is oysters have been in massive decline over the past couple of decades. Something like 80-90% of oyster reefs have been lost worldwide and that's indicative in the Gulf as well. The oyster work is part of a nearly $100 million payout to also help restore sea turtles, marine mammals, and birds. This is the first in a series of oil spill recovery plans for the region. Bill Rodney with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department notes that by helping oyster reefs grow bigger and taller, shorelines are better protected from storm surge, rising sea levels, and erosion. So we're doing that in Texas, and it's building on work we've already done, so we don't have to do it all in one project. We're sort of integrating it into what's already out there in the landscape. Hansen says most people appreciate oysters on the half shell at their local seafood restaurant, but don't realize the small mollusks filter up to 50 gallons of water a day, improving water quality by removing pollutants, sediment, and other particles. So an oyster creates reef. It's almost like a coral reef in its ecological importance. These oysters are habitat engineers, and that reef creates habitat, and that habitat has a, a bunch of ecosystem services. In addition to habitat, he says healthy oyster reefs provide food and breeding grounds for fish which in the Gulf ranges from red drum and spotted sea trout to crabs. 
For Texas News Service, I'm Roz Brown. You are listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6 with a half-hour edition on the weekends. You can hear any newscast you like, listen to it whenever you want. They're archived online at kpfa.org. I'm Mark Merkel. President Joe Biden and China's Xi Jinping will hold their much-anticipated virtual summit on Monday evening as the two sides look to dial back tensions after a rough start to the U.S.-China relationship when Biden took office earlier this year. The White House is setting low expectations for the video call between the leaders. Biden looks to stress that the two nations need to set guardrails in deepening areas of conflict in the increasingly complicated relationship between the two nations. White House officials said no major announcements are expected to come from the meeting. Press Secretary Jen Psaki at the White House today. It will meet virtually with President Xi Jinping of the People's Republic of China. The two leaders will discuss ways to responsibly manage the competition between the United States and the PRC, as well as ways to work together where our interests align. The U.S. Holocaust Museum this week came out with a report that China's actions towards the minority population of Uyghurs in the country may amount to genocide, uh, its use of, of forced slave labor and forced sterilizations and other actions. Is that something that the president is going to bring up with Xi Jinping? And is, is that something that the president will hold up as uh, something that Xi Jinping needs to take action on to reverse before the U.S. Uh, uh, gets closer in its relationship with China? Well, I would say that one of the purposes of this leader-to-leader -leader engagement is to also discuss areas where you have strong concern and disagreement. And, you know, it's not just the president's words, though. We've also acted. Uh, we are engaged, first of all, with members of Congress and uh, on technical advising, providing technical assistance on legislation that's currently working its way through Congress. But in addition to that, we've also taken concrete measures on our own, including visa restrictions, global Magnitsky and financial sanctions, export controls, import restrictions, the release of a business advisory and rallying the G7 to commit to take action to ensure all global supply chains are free from the use of forced labor. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. The meeting on Monday evening will be the third engagement between the two leaders since February. It comes after the U.S. and China this week pledged at U.N. climate talks in Glasgow, Scotland to increase their cooperation and speed up action to rein in climate damaging emissions. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and China's senior foreign policy advisor came to an agreement on holding the Biden G virtual summit by year's end when they met last month for talks in Zurich, but the two sides had not settled on a date. The Kremlin is denying allegations that a buildup of Russian troops near Ukraine reflects Moscow's aggressive intentions. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov dismissed Western media reports, alleging that Moscow has intentions to invade Ukraine as hollow and undocumented attempts to incite tensions. Peskov told reporters that Russia needs to ensure its security in response to alleged NATO threats. And his country doesn't threaten anyone. Ukraine says Russia has kept tens of thousands of troops not far from their border to exert pressure on its ex-Soviet neighbor. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said today that Russia's past actions against Ukraine are cause for real concerns about what we're seeing in the present. Germany's Disease Control Center is calling for people to cancel or avoid large events and to reduce their contacts as the country's coronavirus infection rate hits the latest in a string of new highs. The center, the Robert Koch Institute, said today that Germany's infection rate climbed to 263 new cases per 100,000 residents over seven days, up from 249 the previous day. Germany reported 48,640 new cases today, a day after the daily total topped 50,000 for the first time. 
Another 191 COVID deaths brought Germany's total in the pandemic so far to 97,389. While the infection rate isn't yet as high as in some other European countries, its relentless rise in Germany has set off alarm bells. Outgoing Chancellor Angela Merkel plans to meet with the country's 16 state governors to coordinate nationwide measures next week. And the German parliament is mulling legislation that would provide new legal frameworks for restrictions over the winter. Trent Murray reports from Berlin. Over 48,000 new cases were recorded Friday, a 31% increase compared to the same day last week. It comes a day after the country set an all-time pandemic high of 50,000 new infections. With the resurgence showing little sign of slowing down, Acting Health Minister Jens Spahn will hold a press conference Friday to update how the government is responding to the new wave. It's expected additional restrictions could soon be introduced to try and slow the spread. In neighbouring Austria, the government is preparing to introduce stricter lockdown measures that target the unvaccinated. And that's Trent Murray reporting from Berlin. Colorado's Democratic Governor Jeff Paulus has joined California in turning aside advice from federal guidance on COVID-19 booster shots, limiting them to people over 65 and others at high risk of infection. The governor has issued an order allowing all residents 18 years of age and older to get them. Paulus's order declares all of Colorado at high risk of infection. Hospitals in Colorado are overwhelmed. New Mexico's hospitals also nearing capacity. In Michigan, the three-county metro Detroit area again becoming a hot spot for transmissions. COVID-19 cases are on the rise in 29 states. Public health officials are alarmed at the rise coming as it does ahead of the holiday season when people will travel and gather, likely sending the number of COVID-19 cases even higher. Authorities say five people were struck by a vehicle during an anti-vaccination mandate protest on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco yesterday. No one was seriously hurt. Authorities say several hundred people were at a rally yesterday afternoon and one lane on the bridge had been closed, jamming traffic. Authorities say during the jam, an SUV collided with a street sweeping vehicle, which was pushed into global highway patrol officers working crowd control. Two CHP officers and three bridge workers were struck. They weren't seriously hurt, although three were taken to a hospital. Arkansas is to lead a 14-state study of the long-term effects of COVID-19 on children with hopes of finding effective treatments to alleviate symptoms. Emily Scott reports. The Arkansas Children's Research Institute in Little Rock is working with more than a dozen other rural states. It's part of a National Institutes of Health program looking at long-haul COVID-19 symptoms in tens of thousands of children and adults across the country. Called the Recover Initiative, Jessica Snowden at the Arkansas Children's Research Institute says it aims to answer puzzling questions about lingering COVID symptoms in kids. We don't know a whole lot about what causes those long-term symptoms or how we can treat them. This is the beginning of a lot of work to substantially improve the lives of kids and families who've been impacted by long-term COVID by identifying new treatments and new prevention strategies. Some of the lasting health problems children are reporting after a COVID diagnosis include headaches and trouble engaging in school. A recent study found among adults, 36% who've been infected with COVID-19 have symptoms that linger for months. Hawaii, New Hampshire, Puerto Rico, and Vermont are on the list to participate in the pediatric study. Snowden says it's exciting to be working with more rural parts of the country, as oftentimes those communities aren't included in national research. We don't know that treatment options are the same in New York as they are in Arkansas. We felt it was really, really important that these kids get represented in this research as well, so that the answers we come up with apply to kids in areas like ours. Snowden says Arkansas Children's Research Institute hopes to have the study up and running before the end of the year. The work coordinating the multi-state research is funded through a $25 million award from the NIH. 
I'm Emily Scott with Arkansas News Service. President Joe Biden is nominating former Food and Drug Administration Commissioner Dr. Robert Califf to again lead the powerful regulatory agency. Califf served as FDA commissioner for the last 11 months of President Barack Obama's second term. Before that, Califf spent more than 35 years as a prominent researcher at Duke University. The FDA oversees COVID-19 vaccines, drugs, and tests, along with thousands of other medicines and consumer goods. Califf's nomination comes after months of concern that the FDA has lacked a permanent leader. Johnson & Johnson is splitting into two companies, separating the division that sells Band-Aids and Listerine from its medical device and prescription drug business. The company said today that the division selling prescription drugs and medical devices will keep the Johnson & Johnson name. William Denisler reports. The split would separate the part of the business that makes household brands like Band-Aids and Listerine mouthwash from J&J's wing that makes and sells medical devices and prescription drugs, including the COVID-19 vaccine. In a statement, outgoing CEO Alex Gorski said the move will accelerate efforts to serve patients and consumers, drive profitability and improve healthcare outcomes globally. William Danslow, New York. Medicare's Part B outpatient premium will jump by $21.60 next year, one of the largest increases ever. Officials said today a new Alzheimer's drug is responsible for about half of that price increase. The increase guarantees that health care costs will gobble up a big chunk of the recently announced Social Security cost of living allowance, a boost that had worked out to $92 a month for the average retired worker. The announcement on premiums comes as Congress is considering Democratic legislation that would curb what Medicare pays for medications. The new Part B premium will be $170 a month now. Two former Oklahoma police officers face up to 10 years in prison after being convicted of murder for using their stun guns more than 50 times on an unarmed man who later died. A Carter County jury last week convicted former Wilson police officers Brandon Dingman and Joshua Taylor of second-degree murder. They each face up to 10 years in prison when they're sentenced next month. Court documents said that two officers used their stun guns on 22-year-old Jared Lakely more than 50 times on July 4th, 2019, which was a substantial factor in Lakey's death. Lakey died two days later. Taylor's attorney said he planned to appeal. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper has pardoned a man who spent 24 years behind bars for a murder he had long said he did not commit. The pardon of innocence issued today allows Dante Sharp to apply for compensation of $50,000 a year, up to three quarters of a million for his wrongful conviction. 1995, Sharp received a life sentence for first-degree murder. He was released from prison in 2019 after a medical examiner testified that the state's theory of the shooting was not medically or scientifically possible, and the state decided against pursuing a retrial. Sharp had maintained his innocence throughout. The NAACP says a hate crime was committed when three high school students in the small Texas town of Woodsboro, dressed up as members of the Ku Klux Klan and victimized six other children, including one black schoolmate who was tased. The others were reportedly chased and threatened. Matt Manning is the attorney for the tased victim. He said the incident can't be brushed off as simply youthful hijinks or antics. When we talk about the Ku Klux Klan, we're talking about a particularly evocative group for black Americans. We're talking a group that has made its name in terrorizing our people, in menacing and killing and lynching black people and differently abled people and our brothers and sisters of the LGBTQ community and Jews and immigrants. We all know the Klan. The reason that's important is this cannot be analyzed as kids just being kids. It cannot be analyzed as boys just being boys. It must be analyzed as a purposeful, specifically intended uh, crime with the intent of terrorizing young black people and young people in general.
Manning said he believes the three high school students who dressed up in Klan outfits are members of the football team. School administrators allowed the three to play in a subsequent football game. The superintendent of Woodsboro School District said that while they were deeply disappointed that any of their students would find this type of behavior acceptable, the district cannot discipline students for conduct that occurs off campus. Attorney Manning disagrees and quoted from school guidelines that he says would have allowed school officials to bar the three from the football field. Another search for Indian remains at the site of a former residential school in Canada is underway. This one in Ontario. Earlier this week, it was at a site in the province of Saskatchewan. Dan Karpinchuk reports. A task force made up of Six Nations police, survivors, and community members are using two ground-penetrating radar machines to conduct grid searches of about 500 acres of land around the former school, the Mohawk Institute Residential School. One survivor says she takes comfort in knowing that this sacred work is being done in a good way with the participation of the community. Mark Hill is a member of the Mohawk Nation and the chief of the Six Nations of the Grand River. We have finally made it to this day where we are ready to begin the search. Survivors have been telling us for years the stories of what happened to them in these so-called schools. This investigation and the important work that comes with it is for survivors and is led by survivors. The search is expected to continue all week. First Nations counselors will be on hand to help prepare the community for the potential findings. The Mohawk Institute Residential School is believed to be Canada's longest-running residential school, opening in 1828 and closing in 1971. The residential schools, funded by the government and run by the churches, operated from about the mid-1800s to the late 1990s. They were supposed to help assimilate Native children into white society. About 150,000 Native children attended the schools across Canada. Thousands were abused. Many died. For National Native News, I'm Dan Karpinchuk. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno, online, kpfa.org. I'm Eileen Alfandari inviting you to join us at 7 each weekday morning for Upfront. We bring you breaking news, hard-hitting interviews, debates, and in-depth analysis. From the halls of the state capitol, to the far reaches of the globe, to the streets of Oakland. On KPFA 94.1 FM, KFCF Fresno 88.1 FM, online at kpfa.org. Join us at 7 a.m. for Upfront. A Taliban spokesman says a bomb exploded in a mosque during Friday prayers in a town outside the eastern Afghanistan city of Jalalabad, wounding at least 15 people. It was the third major mosque bombing in five weeks in Afghanistan, following attacks on two mosques on two successive Fridays last month. The Islamic State group has been waging a campaign of violence against Afghanistan's new Taliban rulers. The Gulf nation of Qatar has agreed to represent U.S. interests in Afghanistan following the closure of the American embassy in Kabul in late August. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and his Qatari counterpart say Qatar will serve as the protecting power for the United States in Taliban-run Afghanistan. That means Qatar will handle consular services for American citizens in Afghanistan and assume responsibility for the protection of now vacated U.S. diplomatic facilities there. The announcement is a clear indication that the Biden administration does not intend to reopen the embassy anytime soon. Blinken, meanwhile, says the U.S. has offered the opportunity to leave Afghanistan to all American citizens it's identified as remaining in the country who wish to depart. The death of F.W. de Klerk, the last apartheid president of South Africa, has revived a fierce debate in the country about how its history should be remembered. De Klerk's role in dismantling apartheid and holding the country's first democratic elections has been remembered by a range of public figures and organizations. But others can never forget his role in the crimes of apartheid. Nick Alexandra reports from Johannesburg, South Africa. 
Denial, obfuscation, that was how de Klerk will be remembered in terms of his appearance before the Truth Commission. That's Yasmin Suka, a member of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She believes de Klerk's unbanning of black liberation parties and releasing political prisoners in 1990 were moves calculated to retain the economic power of the white minority in the face of mass mobilization in South Africa and growing pressure internationally. When he did appear before the TRC, Suka says, He denied any knowledge of the atrocities perpetrated by the apartheid state and its security forces. He also said that this was not the policy of his government and that he refused to accept any responsibility for any of the actions perpetrated by these death squads and operatives and that those he did it were bad apples for which he refused to accept any responsibility. Fort Delata was an anti-apartheid activist who was brutally murdered with three other comrades by apartheid security police in 1985. The men became known as the Craddock Four and at the time de Klerk was a member of the state security council that directed their killing. The families are pushing for the case to be finally prosecuted and Fort Delata's son, Lucanio, De Klerk's death means that his family will never be able to hear his testimony or receive justice. Well, it's sad, isn't it, that yet another apartheid criminal has died before he was held accountable for the crimes that he perpetrated against our humanity. It's sad that we will never know the truth around what he knew about the murders of the Craddock Four. Many mourn de Klerk's passing as a South African who played a historic role in dismantling apartheid through a negotiated settlement that avoided further bloodshed. Tuli Maronsela is a former anti-corruption lawyer for the government who says de Klerk was courageous. He also deserves to be commended for the video he has left where he comes clean in acknowledging that apartheid was wrong, that it caused a lot of pain, suffering, indignity, and damage. But for others, this apology, put out posthumously by the F.W. de Klerk Foundation, rang hollow. De Klerk sparked a political firestorm last year when he said that apartheid wasn't a crime against humanity. His foundation eventually walked back the comments after the opposition economic freedom fighters called for his Nobel Prize to be rescinded, and the American Bar Association revoked an invitation following intense pressure from South African human rights groups. But de Klerk himself never fully reversed his position. Eusebius McKaiser is an analyst with Times Live, a popular news website. He says that de Klerk squandered an opportunity. He goes to the grave with a deep conviction that apartheid geography and spatial planning had good intentions, was morally neutral, rather than conceding that it was intrinsically racist. Imtiaz Kaji is the nephew of Ahmed Timur, a member of the South African Communist Party who was murdered in police custody in 1971. He is still seeking justice for his uncle and says that in the last few years, de Klerk opposed the prosecution of apartheid-era cases. The clerk had an opportunity to take responsibility and accountability for the deaths of the Craddock Four, for those killed in Transkai in a defense force raid in the early 1990s when innocent young boys that were killed and murdered, and for all the activities that took place under his watch when he was head of the Nationalist Party. He failed to do so. So in my, in my mind, he will be remembered as the accused because... No criminal charges were laid against him. He could not face the full wrath of the law. So while de Klerk is remembered globally primarily as a Nobel laureate who helped pave the way for democracy, for many in South Africa, it is still the crimes of apartheid that endure. Nick Alexandra for KPFA in Johannesburg. A court in military ruled Myanmar is sentenced detained U.S. journalist Danny Fenster to 11 years in prison at hard labor. 
after finding him guilty on several charges, including incitement for allegedly spreading false or inflammatory information. Fenster was the managing editor of the online magazine Frontier Myanmar. His attorney said Fenster wept in court after hearing the sentence and had not yet decided on whether to appeal. He's the only foreign journalist to be convicted of a serious offense since the Army seized power in February in a military coup. Fenster's been detained since May. He still faces two additional serious charges in a different court for allegedly violating the counterterrorism law and a statute covering treason and sedition. The coup government has cracked down hard on press freedom, shutting virtually all critical outlets and arresting about 100 journalists, roughly 30 of whom remain in jail. Turkey has halted airline ticket sales to Iraqi, Syrian, and Yemeni citizens wanting to travel to Belarus, which in recent months has become a key step for migrants and refugees trying to illegally enter the European Union. Today's move, announced by Turkey's Civil Aviation Authority, follows EU pressure on airlines to stop bringing people from the Middle East to Minsk, the capital of Belarus. Starting from there, thousands of asylum seekers have managed to cross into EU members Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia since the summer. But thousands are also being stopped in the woods on the border. The situation is threatening to become a humanitarian crisis as winter approaches. It is also creating another point of tension between the West and Belarus. Japan's new foreign minister says it was important to build constructive and stable ties with China while calling for responsible behavior from its giant neighbor. Staunch U.S. ally Japan has recently been more outspoken on questioning China's assertiveness on issues such as the disputed South China Sea and self-ruled Taiwan, which China claims as its territory. At the same time, Japan's ruling party plans to review defensive posturing amid China's military buildup, and it aims to increase defense spending sharply. Yoshimasa Hayashi, in his first news conference as the new foreign minister, stressed the importance of constructive, stable relations with China. Reporter Phoebe Amorosa has more from Tokyo. Hayashi was known for heading a non-partisan lawmakers group that promotes Japan-China relations, but he said on Thursday that he was stepping down to avoid any unnecessary misunderstanding. He said Japan should work towards a strong relationship with China. The former education minister is a close ally of Prime Minister Kishida. Kishida has stressed the need for strengthening dialogue with Japan's neighbor. Phoebe Amoroso, Tokyo. Michigan and local officials have been targeted in a lawsuit over high levels of lead in Benton Harbor's drinking water. The lawsuit was filed this week in federal court. It accuses the state and the city of deliberate indifference in their response to the problem, which began to emerge in 2018. Michigan has been supplying free bottled water for weeks and is pledging to help Benton Harbor replace lead service lines outside of homes. Lead has been leaching from the old pipes, although chemicals to reduce corrosion have been applied. Today was to be another day of hot, dry, and gusty weather across Southern California as Santa Ana winds sweep the region. The National Weather Service says more temperature records were likely to be set today. A high of 95 degrees in Anaheim was among a half dozen records set yesterday as conditions brought elevated risk of wildfires. The Los Angeles County Fire Department says a brush fire that erupted on Santa Catalina Island was stopped after scorching 17 acres. Forecasters say a cooling trend will slowly develop over the weekend, but temperatures will remain well above normal early next week. Mostly sunny tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the upper 60s. It will be in the low 70s further inland away from the bay. In the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, partly cloudy with a high of 70 degrees and continued hot in the Los Angeles area tomorrow. Under sunny skies, high will be near 90 degrees. That's it for the news tonight for this Friday. 
November 12th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Maracle. Good evening. Tune in Friday nights starting at 7 p.m. with Full Circle, a magazine-style show featuring the voices of the KPFA Apprenticeship Program. Then at 8 p.m. is La Onda Bajita, a lowrider cruising show with a mix of barrio oldies and raza knowledge. End the week off with a bag of uncut funk with Ricky Vincent hosting the History of Funk at 10 p.m. That's Friday nights on 94.1 KPFA and KPFA.org. <laughs> You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.